Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name's Tom Pereira, W1TP. I've been a ham for 70 years this year and loved every minute of it. I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Enigma machine and how the codes, World War II codes, were broken uh, on the Enigma machine. And we'll start out by uh, uh, taking a look at uh, what I looked at, looked like at 15. That was when I got my first license in uh, 1953, 70 years ago. And my parents had a lot of money. So I said, Daddy, I want a receiver. He said, sure, kid. And I went and bought a Collins receiver. <laughs> and uh, I said, Daddy, I want a transmitter. And the guy down in Radio Row said, sorry, kid, I can't sell you a transmitter. You got to build your first transmitter. Man, he passed up the sale of a Collins 32 V1 to teach a poor little kid a lesson. And it was the best lesson I ever had in my life because one year later, my shack looked like this. And you can see I built that pair of 813 kilowatt on the left. Uh, you can see a lot of interesting receivers there, uh, especially look at that uh, uh, Hallicrafters DD1. Very, very, very interesting receiver in the middle of my operating desk. Two receivers in one, you could combine uh, whichever antenna was pulling in the best signal. So ham radio has been a lot of fun for me. And while I was doing that, I was playing professor, professor of neuroscience, teaching people about the brain. And uh, after a while, I realized, hey, the brain is really an enigma. <laughs> and the enigma is really a puzzle. So uh, I started getting real interested in enigmas. And that's where I'm going to take you today. I'm going to take you on a little tour through the history of the enigma right up to the present. And we start out in Europe at the end of World War I in 1919. The Treaty of Versailles was signed. And that treaty said the Germans cannot have an army, an air force, or a navy. It split Germany into two parts there. That little red thing in the middle is Poland. All of a sudden, popped up in the middle. The Germans were really, really not happy about this. And one German in particular was really, really not happy about this. And he screamed and he yelled, but he also did something really sneaky and he started secretly building up the German army and the German Air Force and the German Navy. For the army, he pretended that the soldiers were being trained in hunting clubs, not soldier, not to be soldiers. For the Air Force, the pilots who were going to fl be flying those fighters were trained in glider clubs. For the Navy, sailors were trained in local sailing clubs. And it was all a secret, really important that it stay secret, because if Hitler violated the Versailles Treaty, everybody would dump on Germany and it would uh, be very, very bad. So how did he hide it? Well, he used something called an Enigma machine. And every single branch of the German military used an Enigma machine to hide and to encrypt their messages. Um, on the left there, you see people in, in the field and uh, the U-boats, every single U-boat had a, an Enigma machine, every submarine that is had an Enigma machine on board. And they even hid the buildup of the concentration camps, which led to the Holocaust. So nobody knew what was going on in Germany. And they felt that their Enigma machine was so good that they could talk about anything and nobody would know what they were talking about. The German submarines used uh, Enigma machines to communicate, and they were the most effective of all the military branches of the military, German military. In uh, World War II, there were a total of 1,152 German U-boats during the war, and those U-boats sank 3,000 of our allied ships, killed 150,000 men, and sank 15 million tons of shipping. So it was really scary. Those U-boats essentially blockaded Europe and England from getting any necessary supplies. And Churchill, the um, prime minister of England, uh, uh, stated that the U-boats are the greatest danger in World War II. So something had to be done about those U-boats. Every U-boat had a Enigma machine on board. And this is a typical location for an Enigma on a U-boat. And the 
You, uh, the Enigma machine was invented by a German named Arthur Scherbius. He named it Enigma. He patented the first Enigma machine that you see on the left. Huge, terrible thing. 300 pounds cost about the equivalent of $20,000. And it just didn't sell. He, he was planning on selling the corporations for their own um, corporate security, but they didn't sell. Finally, somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, why don't you make a cheaper version? And that's what he did. He made one that fitted in a little box, looked a little like a typewriter. And uh, that started being produced in 1922. And it was unchanged all the way to, to the end of the war. And the fact that the Enigma was basically unchanged throughout the entire war is amazing that they were that dumb because it was clear that people were going to try and crack the Enigma machine. So why don't you change it a little bit? Well, they were so confident in the design of the Enigma that they were sure that nobody could ever break the code. And we're going to see why now. Here's the Enigma machine. The major components are straightforward. You've got a keyboard, just like a typewriter keyboard. You've got a light bulb panel. The light bulbs light up when you press one of those keys. You have rotors, three rotors, and a reflector, which we'll talk about, but they just change the wiring of the machine. And you have a plug board on the front of the machine that also changes the wiring that determines what letter lights up when you press a keyboard key. The Enigma is really, really ridiculously simple. It only has a total of 80 wires. I've counted them, <laughs> literally only 80 wires in this thing. And it is very, very simple. It's got, as you can see, the keyboard in the middle, the plug boards over on the right disassembled and the light bulb panel is on the left. And the rotors go in the middle there where it says rotors. So how does the Enigma work? Let's look at its basic job to take a word and make that word absolutely ununderstandable. So you take the word Enigma and every letter in that word is changed to another letter. And one of the things about Enigma machines is it can never take a letter and encode the letter as a, the same letter. So here we have a plain text word Enigma. We call that the plain text. And you type it into Enigma, E-N-I-G-M-A, into the keyboard, and lights light up that um, represent the coded version or ciphertext version of the word Enigma. So when it's done, the Enigma has produced a word, X-P-T-Q-F-K, which doesn't look at all like the word Enigma, and is very, very difficult pretty much impossible to uh, re-decipher back into the word enigma unless you have another enigma machine. And if you have another enigma machine and you set the other enigma machine to exactly the same initial setting or day's key as the setting where you typed in that word, then when you type in X, E lights up, P lights up N, T lights up I, and so on. And X, P, T, Q, F, K all of a sudden becomes lighted up light bulbs, E, N, I, G, M, A. That's the whole job of an enigma. And it's really very, very, very simple. When you see the circuit, you'll see how simple it is. Here's a picture typing in the letter A, and you can see the light bulb H has lit up. So the enigma machine is now enciphering the letter A into the ciphertext letter H. Just so you get used to the uh, terminology, the A is called plain text and the H is called the cipher text. Now here's the wiring diagram that lets the Enigma do it. And it is literally no more complicated than a flashlight. Uh, when you press the letter A key, you'll notice that it makes contact with the battery on the right side, an electric voltage flows from that battery to the plug board on the front of the Enigma. There, a wire may connect from the letter A on the plug board over to O. So A has been enciphered over to O just on the plug board. Then it goes through a series of rotors and the O enters this stack of rotors, goes all the way over to the left, 
enters a thing called a reflector, which is just kind of a bounce back rotor where the incoming signal is uh, reflected back out of the reflector. Then it goes through the three rotors again and the entry drum where it just entered. And it now has exited the rotor stack as the letter M. The electrical signal then goes to M on the plug board. And if there's a wire on the plug board that connects over to the letter H, then H is the final encoded version of the letter A. And it's indicated by a voltage that goes and lights up the H light bulb. So we typed in the letter A and the H light bulb lit up. Think about that circuit. There is nothing complicated in there. It's a battery, a switch, and a light bulb, and a little bit of wiring. That's it. That's what an enigma is all about. And if you are to take the uh, same exact starting key on an enigma and you type in the letter H, which you remember was the cipher text, uh, into the Enigma. And remember, this Enigma has now been said exactly the same as the Enigma was that coded the message. When you type in the H, which was the coded version of A, the light bulb A will light up. So we see how an Enigma can encode a message or a letter into another letter. In this case, we looked at A encoding into H and how H can be decoded back into the letter A. And that's what it's all about. Here is the wiring that shows the H being decoded back into the letter A. And you'll see it's the same circuit, exactly. Press the H and the battery puts a voltage into the H um, connector on the plug board, which is jumpered over to the letter M on the plug board. It goes through the rotor stack as M, and it comes out after a number of changes as O. It goes to the O on the plug board, and it then jumpered over to the A, and lo and behold, yes, the H has now been decoded back into the letter A. That's all there is to an enigma. It's really quite amazing. So here's another diagram just to clarify this. On the left-hand enigma, we type in the letter A on the keyboard, the letter H lights up on the light bulb panel. That ciphertext message is the secret coded version of our plain text mission. And you get it over to another Enigma by either radioing it, telephoning it, sending it by Morse code, or sending it by a messenger. Somehow the message, the coded message, letter H gets over to another Enigma, type in the H on the keyboard, and the A lights up and you get back your original uh, plain text message. That's what an enigma does. Every time you type in a letter on the keyboard, though, after it's encoded the message, the rotors rotate one notch. And what that means is that all of that wiring in the rotor stack has changed. And instead of A getting the letter H to light up, after you change those rotor settings, the typing in the plain text letter A may get an X to light up. And I hope you can see that you could type in the letter A over and over again and get different ciphertext letters out. The one thing you couldn't ever get would be the letter A. And that was one of the weaknesses of the Enigma, the fact that it could never encode a plain text letter as the same letter. And that was helpful in decoding and breaking the Enigma code. So a day's key, what do we mean by that? Well, it turns out the day's key is a bunch of settings of the Enigma. The first settings up at the top is the rotor number. There are five different rotors uh, that are supplied with an Enigma, and three of them are put into the Enigma, and they can be put in in any order. So the rotor number and position along the axle gives us 60 possible settings. The internal rotor ring settings, every rotor has a little internal setting. And with those three rotors, you can have 676 internal ring settings. The initial starting positions of the rotors 
That is whether the left-hand rotor is A and the next one is B and the next one is C or whatever. There are 17,576 of those. And which cables are plugged into the jumper panel on the front of the Enigma and how many cables are plugged in? You can have anywhere from no cables plugged in to 13 cables plugged in. And that gives us five times 10 to the 15 power possible settings. So the total number of days keys that you can have for the Army and Air Force Enigma machine is 10 to the 114th power. And that's an amazingly big number when you think of the fact that the total number of atoms, atoms in the entire observable universe is only 10 to the 80th power. And we're talking about 10 to the 114th power. Here's another way to look at it. Here is one followed by 114 zeros. In order to decode the message of an enigma, you have to set the decoding enigma to one of those 10 to the 114th power settings. And to give you a little more reality on this, the chance of winning the Powerball lottery is one in 10 to the eighth. So we're talking about a really, really big, big, big number. And these initial settings are circulated to every Enigma machine on a, in a code book, which is brought by uh, messengers to every Enigma installation. And those code books were kept very, very secret, but a few of them did manage to get out. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The most uh, uh, totally convinced person that the Enigma was unbreakable was Grand Admiral Carl Dernitz. He was the Fuhrer or head of the U-Boat Command. And he developed the Wolfpack strategy, which meant that he's, uh, and his submarines would radio back to him what their position was, and he would tell them exactly where to go to intercept an enemy convoy. And this would all be done by Enigma code. He was so absolutely and totally convinced that his Enigma machines were completely unreadable, that he had every single one of his submarines um, send back to him in Morse code, Enigma coded Morse code, the exact latitude and longitude of that submarine throughout the entire war. So over on the right, you see the submarine. The submarine is just sent back to uh, Dönitz on the left. Uh, this is my latitude and longitude, and I'm attacking a convoy. Now, of course, Dönitz knew that the Allies could intercept these radio transmissions. After all, they were just radio transmissions on the normal um, uh, high frequencies, and they were being sent in plain Morse code uh, that we're all familiar with. The trick was they were being encoded by an Enigma machine. He was so sure that these messages were uncrackable that he used an immense transmitter. They called Goliath. It was the biggest radio transmitter in the world at that point. It ran one million watts, one megawatt. The antenna was over a half a mile in size and it transmitted on the very, very low frequencies of 15 to 60 kilohertz. And it put out so much power that you could use a crystal set in the United States and have your earphones blown off by this thing. Uh, and the very low frequency allowed it to penetrate the water a little bit and made it so submarines could raise an antenna just slightly above the water and receive their messages. So he was convinced and what he was doing was broadcasting to the entire world in Enigma coded messages where and what the submarines should do and what convoys they should attack. And of course, the British intercepted these. Here's a typical intercept station. They wrote down the Morse coded messages and they used direction finders to locate the submarines. But at first they were unable to decode the messages because how can you possibly know which one of the 10 to the 114th power um, Dave's keys is being used in order to decipher the message. Uh, again, Churchill very worried about this and they were really a major danger. It looked for a while as though uh, England was 
uh, going to lose the battle completely because it was surrounded by U-boats and they were cutting off all the supplies. And at this point, if you saw the movie Imitation Game, uh, Alan Turing came to the rescue and he solved the Enigma Code and he broke the Enigma Code. And here's the picture of the moment that he broke the code when he figured out that the Germans probably signed all their messages, Heil Hitler, and he typed in Heil Hitler on this enigma in front of him, and he managed to decode a message. This is totally and completely wrong, totally wrong. The only good thing that's honestly correct about the movie is that I found that enigma machine. You'll see it when I first located it, and they used my enigma in the movie. But everything about Alan Turing and his... Uh, uh, cracking of the Enigma codes was incorrect, as we'll see in a moment. He also showed Alan Turing with this amazing computer-like thing that he built and designed, supposedly, to crack the Enigma code. But it turns out that this machine was designed and built six years before Alan Turing even began working on the Enigma by three Polish mathematicians in Poland, who were really afraid that Poland was about to be overrun by Germany. And they worked on the Enigma codes and figured out six years before the war started, first of all, how to decipher Enigma messages. And they also designed the first Enigma deciphering machines, which they named Bombas. Um, nobody knows why. Maybe it sounds like a ticking time bomb. It was also the name of a Polish uh, chocolate dessert, but <laughs> and whatever it is, the Poles uh, devised this word. They built their own machines to decipher the enigma, but the first thing they did was to figure out the exact wiring maze or rotor wiring inside enigmas. And this is a big puzzle. Every letter on the right side of this uh, typical Enigma rotor is wired over to a letter on the left side of the rotor in a pretty random fashion called the wiring maze. And nobody had any idea what the wiring maze was for each of the six ro five rotors that were uh, being used in Enigmas. And these three mathematicians under the leadership of a man named Rievsky, managed to figure out the actual wiring of every one of the five rotors. And that's an, many people think of that as perhaps the most extraordinary mathematical achievement in the history of mathematics. Uh, the Polish Enigma replica then was built by the Poles simply replicating an enigma. They built their own enigmas to help them in deciphering the enigma code. They built a number of these and they were helpful as they tried to learn ways of deciphering the enigma codes. They also built machines, uh, which they called again, Bombas for deciphering. On the left is a manual machine where you put uh, enigma rotors on the left side and another set of enigma rotors on the right side. And you spin them around by hand and look at which ones provide electrical continuity and light up light bulbs on the front. And that was a way of speeding up deciphering the enigma and figuring out what the day's key was. Shortly after that, they built the device on the right, uh, which is a motor-driven version of the device on the left and spins the rotors that you see on top of the box there to speed up the uh, comparing of the different rotors electrically and searching for the exact uh, setting to set the enigma for. So the Poles were actually fully deciphering German enigma messages six years before Poland was invaded by Germany in 1939. That was the start of World War II. And when that happened, Germany literally crossed the border into Poland. You see the red Polish country here being just overrun by the Germans. And of course, the Polish mathematicians had to make a run for it. So they took their Enigma replicas and all of the plans for their bombas 
destroyed those that they had to live, leave behind, and they headed for England by way of France. And eventually, they ended up in England, and they gave this information to the British in a place which is called Bletchley Park. That's where the British had set up secret uh, Enigma decoding headquarters. And they had had absolutely no luck whatsoever in breaking the Enigma code. But when the uh, Poles gave them the techniques that they had developed for breaking the Enigma codes, the British were able to start breaking the code, and they started deciphering Enigma messages just as the Poles had. They called these deciphered messages ultra, ultra intelligence, and they used that ultra to learn what the Germans were planning and doing throughout the entire war, and also what the submarines were doing. Uh, 10,000 code breakers worked at Bletchley Park, and every single one of them kept that secret that the British had decoded the Enigma message for 30 years after the end of the war. It was such a complete secret. They were all told that they would be killed under the Official Secret Act if they ever told anybody. They, they didn't tell their spouses. They didn't tell their family, their parents. Nobody knew that this had taken off. The unfortunate thing is that while all this was going on, they failed to ever mention, oh, by the way, the Poles gave us this information. And so most people believe that the British were the ones who cracked the Enigma code. And uh, it was only much, much later, 60 years after the war, that Bletchley Park put up a little monument saying, Oh, thank you, Poles. You were very helpful in helping us break the Enigma Code. They didn't really point out the fact that um, what many people think that uh, Turing would have been unable to break the Enigma Code until five years after the end of the war uh, without the help of the Poles, which means that the code wouldn't have been broken until 1950. So there are a lot of, lot of history there. Turing was indeed a great mathematical brain, and he did a great number of things. And what he did was to take the Polish machine, which as you saw, was pretty basic, and design a British version of the Bomba. And you can see those triplets of wheels and they spin at high speed. And the machine looks for coincidences between electrical signals and uh, allows you to decode Enigma messages much, much faster than the Polish machine and much, much, much faster than any other technique that had been developed. So the British were breaking the code, but it was the Poles who really showed them how. This is the back of the machine, and this machine was designed by Turing using the Polish philosophy and underlying uh, technology. And as you can see, it's very complex, purely, purely electromechanical. Those are all uh, uh, relays and switches, but that was the first uh, 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 code breaking, enigma breaking machine. And eventually it morphed into a much more complicated version, which used electronic vacuum tubes, was called Colossus, and was used when the Germans finally got around. Uh, Dönitz got a little scared when all of his submarines were being sunk, and so he insisted that the Germans add a fourth rotor to their Enigma. And so the submarines had four rotor Enigmas in them, but the head of the Air Force named Goering said, hey, you can't do that. My guys won't be able to read your Enigma messages. And so Goering forced the um, redesign of the Enigma, the four rotor Enigma to be set up so that if you have the leftmost or fourth rotor in the A position, all of the wiring is exactly the same as it is in a three rotor Enigma. And that was a big giveaway, made it much, much easier to ultimately crack the four rotor Enigma codes and read the exact position of every submarine uh, uh, that was out there. Cracking the Enigma code really was the impetus to the development of computers. Uh, if you look in the upper uh, line there, you see the Polish uh, code breaking bombas. Uh, down below, you see the British bomb, the British Colossus. And then the Americans got on board. They started building these machines uh, for four rotor 
Navy enigmas. You can see the four rotors stacked up under the American bomb um, label there. And that all led to the development of the very early computers, such as the Atlas in 1954, the RCA 501 in 1958, and then a bunch of IBM computers. So this book, which is put out by the NSA, and you can actually write to them and have them send, send you a copy of this book, uh, talks about cryptology's role in the early development of computer capabilities in the United States. And if you think about it carefully, uh, you come to the conclusion that the Enigma itself may have been the very first computer, depending on how you uh, define computers. Uh, but it has an input and a storage system, an internal processing system, and an output, which is the light bulb panel. And you can argue that the Enigma itself may have been the first laptop computer. If not, you can go over to Colossus and be pretty sure that you're talking about a computer. And uh, people have been arguing about that for a long time. What was the first computer? In any event, Turing was also helped by a few other things. Uh, in a few cases, U-boats were captured and the code book that I showed you was recovered from the U-boat before it sank or uh, it, so in some cases they were they didn't actually sink one of those u-boats that was captured with its enigma and kobo is u505 which is on display in the science museum in um uh, Chicago. And there's a picture of U-505 on the left being captured by a, a British destroyer. And they got on board fast enough to keep the Germans from sinking the U-boat, towed it back, and it's now on display. So deciphering the German Enigma messages um, was done, but you couldn't let the Germans know that the messages were being deciphered. If you did, if somehow they caught on that their code was being deciphered, they would have changed the Enigma dramatically or maybe even stopped using it. And the British needed the ability to decipher the messages in order to win the war. So in some cases, the British actually had to allow places to be bombed that they knew from decoded Enigma messages were going to be bombed just to hide the fact. And if they knew where a submarine was, they couldn't just go out and drop bombs on it. They had to cover themselves. And what they would typically do is fly an observation plane over the submarine. The submarine would radio back to Dönitz, hey, I've been spotted, I'm, I'm submerging. And uh, Dönitz would say, oh dear, that was just an accident. They were spotted by an observation plane. And then uh, the the uh, bomber would arrive and sink the submarine. And Dönitz would say, oh, just bad luck kind of thing. To his death, when he died, he still believed that the Enigma machine was uncrackable. But uh, certain um, uh, sacrifices had to be made to keep this all secret. If you look at the uh, the total sort of scorecard, uh, we see that an immense number of submarines, 28,000 crew out of the 40,000 crew, 70% of the crew and 70% of the submarines were lost by the Germans during World War II, primarily because of Enigma deciphering. And if you look at what this means, Enigma deciphering most historians believe shortened the war by two years, approximately saved thousands of lives, prevented Hitler from completing all of the work on the atomic bomb, and revealed to the world what was going on during the Holocaust. And of course, during the Holocaust, Ultra showed exactly what the Germans were doing. They were stupid enough to actually send by Enigma code the exact number of men, women, and children that they had killed in each concentration camp on each day. They sent that back, and of course, the Allies deciphered it. And the question is really, why didn't they do more about it? They, they were trying to win the war. It was very complicated situation. Enigma deciphering, again, was first revealed to the world in 1975, 30 years after the end of the war. And meanwhile, lots and lots of very learned history professors who, who had written uh, the definitive history of World War II, but they didn't know about the enigma. So really, you had to throw out every book 
written by a history professor about World War II that was written and published before 1975, because they were all written without knowing about the enigma. And again, Dernit still refused to believe it when he died uh, in the 1980s. So he just was convinced that uh, it was some new kind of radar or spies were t- tipping off where his submarines were. He, he could never get his head around that. Um, the interesting thing is that the U-boats were also located by direction finding, of course, using um, directional antennas. You could tell where the boats were and send out uh, ships to sink them. But it was difficult because by the time a ship got there, uh, the U-boat would be gone. The amazing thing is the Germans developed a device called the METOX, which was a radar detector, like the thing you put in your car to tell when there are police speed traps around. And any time an allied ship was near a German submarine, this METOX would start beeping at them. Uh, But the strange thing is the designer of the METOX made it as a superheterodyne with a IF frequency and a local oscillator. And the local oscillator actually radiated its own homing signal. So when they turned on the METOX, the METOX was actually sending out a signal. And the British learned that when they heard a signal on the IF frequency of the METOX, that a submarine was near, they would use their direction finding antenna and home in on the submarine and sink it. So it took the Germans over one year to discover that their METOX units were given giving away the location of their submarine. So that was one additional thing that didn't involve the enigma that argued against the Germans and helped sink their submarines. Another one was the fact that they were idiotic enough to force their prisoners of war to build enigma machines. Uh, Here's a picture of prisoners of war building BMW engines. Here's a picture of prisoners prisoners of war being used to build high-tech rocket guidance systems for their V1 and V2 missiles. And here's a picture of what we think may be prisoners of war building Enigma machines. Now, if you get your enemy to build your high-tech devices for you, you know that they're going to try and sabotage them. And sure enough, these uh, prisoners did try to sabotage the things they were forced to build. Uh, When they were forced to build torpedoes for the submarines, they sabotaged the guidance systems. And many, many German submarine torpedoes were uh, led off course by the prisoner sabotage. But Enigmas were different. They, Enigma, had to leave the factory in working condition, had to pass all the tests before it would be allowed out of the factory. And if they found something that was sabotaged in the Enigma, the person who built that Enigma would be killed immediately. So the prisoners had to be very, very careful. And after restoring over 50 Enigma machines, I've been inside all of them, and I found some amazing sabotage techniques that were used. Um, One of my favorite is one of the plugs on the plug board just sort of happens to be floating around loose in the bottom of the Enigma machine. And it, it just must have dropped there sometime during the time it was being built. Of course, it was put there by a prisoner uh, to sabotage the machine. And under normal conditions, when the machine is being tested, it's very, very unlikely that that little uh, connector would interfere with the operation of the machine. But if the connector happens to be right under that black metal horizontal bar that you see there, the result will be that the bar can't come all the way down, that the keys can't be pressed all the way down, that the contacts can't be made, and the Enigma will misfire, will not uh, encode a message, and it'll go on, rotate the rotors again, and completely mess up the system and be unusable. So that's one of the techniques. Another one that I just love, we found fish hooks in the wiring of the Enigma. Now, a fish hook in the wiring isn't going to do much at first, but after it's been there jostled around for six months or a year or so, the point of the fish hook will begin to wear into the metal or poke into the wiring of the machine and short out 
the machine. And when those wires, this is the back of the plug board we're looking at, when those wires are shorted out or the connectors are shorted out by this loose fish hook in there, the machine stops working. Here's another technique that I just love. Uh, a few of the plugs themselves were made with screws that were too long. Uh, normal size screw, when you screw it in, it'll crimp down the wire to the connector and make a good contact. If the screw is too long, the wire won't be crimped snugly down to the contact and it will be intermittent. And the more it's used, the more it's going to be wiggled, the more intermittent it becomes as the screw gradually backs out. So that was one of the techniques that we found. In any event, um, those are techniques that we're using. In some cases, they even reverse the pins on the plugs on the plug board. Normally, you expect to see the, the big pin on top with a small pin on the bottom. And here's one that we found with a small pin on top and the big pin on the bottom. And you can't fit it in to the plug board, uh, which has large and small sockets appropriately. Um, here's another one that we found with some strange kind of substance um, on the screw. The screw gradually becomes non-conductive. And even though it's crimping down that brass um, connector that you see on the wire, the screw itself becomes non-conductive. I don't know what this stuff is. If you rub it on um, some material, you see that it comes off in the upper right there. And you can see that it's whitish and uh, it has the effect of, of eliminating the conductivity between the red wire and the pin on the plug. Neat stuff that they did. Now, at the end of the war, Hitler ordered that every single enigma be destroyed. And that meant that uh, the Germans were supposed to use explosives, shoot the enigmas and throw them in lakes. Most of the Germans didn't like the idea of dropping a hand grenade in an enigma and running. So they would use a gun or jump on the enigma, something like this. That's why there are <clears throat> so very few enigmas left in the world out of the 25 or 30,000 that were made. Only 267 have survived. And that's why they're very rare and uh, the, uh, very expensive. At the end of the war, another really strange thing happened, uh, and that is that Churchill ordered the destruction of every Enigma machine that had been captured, and he ordered the destruction of every British bomb and the plans and papers for those bombs. Nobody understood why he did that. Just made absolutely no sense. Um, 298 enigmas survived, but Churchill tried to eliminate all of them. That's why there are really so few of them. Why did he do that? Well, it was only recently, last year, <clears throat> 70 years after the end of the war, that it was discovered that Churchill did not actually destroy all of the enigmas or all of the deciphering machines. He just let the public think that he had. How did we discover that? Well, in a very strange way, um, I came across an Enigma machine that had a Hebrew keyboard. Now, a German Enigma machine with a Hebrew keyboard made absolutely zero sense. Impossible. Why would the Germans put a Hebrew keyboard on the Enigma? And I tried to get information out of Israel for several years, finally got in touch with the main defense, IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and they had this machine in their museum. And I finally learned the story. And the story was that Churchill had secretly given uh, 30 Enigma machines to Israel and told them, hey, these machines are really good we want you to have very good security in your military. Why don't you just use these machines for all of your secret military communication? Um, they're, they're really very good. And the Israelis took this and they started to use the machines by converting the keyboards over to Hebrew keyboards. So that was done by the Israelis. But 
before the Israelis actually put these machines into use, somebody who had been working at Bletchley Park came up to Ben-Gurion, the head of the Israelis, and said, um, I hear that you are going to be using Enigma machines for your security. Uh, and of course, he couldn't tell uh, he had been sworn to lifetime secrecy. He couldn't tell Ben Gurion that the Enigma had been cracked by the British. And so what he said was, um, "Have you ever heard the story of the Trojan horse?" <laughs> and Ben Gurion got the message and never put these machines into service. And that's how we found one in the storage room of the uh, military, Israeli military. So that's what happened with Churchill and the Israelis. But he also did this with some other countries. He gave Enigma machines to several South American countries and other countries throughout the world um, as gifts. And therefore, the British were able to read all of their encoded messages uh, without letting anybody know that they were reading. Just a little tidbit that turned up in our research. Most of the Enigma machines are in really bad shape in battlefields. You find them occasionally completely wrecked and destroyed. Here's a typical Enigma machine uh, brought up out of a battlefield. Uh, the hand grenade blew it to pieces, and these are just the pieces that uh, have shown up. Uh, here are some more uh, Enigma pieces dug up out of battlefields. Here's a guy digging parts of Enigmas and everything else up in a, a mud swamp using an underwater metal locator. And when we find a relic enigma like this, we look at it very carefully to try and learn something about it. And this machine had actually been shot. You can see the bullet hole right up by the muzzle of this pistol been shot uh, by an officer's pistol. You can measure the size of the hole. <coughs> And the um, bullet had gone and, and destroyed one of the rotors that you see there. So we found out that the officers were the ones that were destroying these enigmas for the, for, for the most part. Hunting for enigmas is really fascinating. This is <coughs> German General Hassel von Mantufel, head of the 3rd Tank Division uh, in Salzdorf, Germany. And he was surrounded by the British and Russian forces, and he didn't want us to, to surrender to the Russians, so he surrendered to the British uh, at the end of the war in 1945. But first, he buried his Enigma machine. And uh, uh, one of the soldiers reported that, but nobody knew where, where it was. So you take a metal detector out in the field where this guy was held prisoner, and you start digging around, you get contact in a hole. And this is digging a hole in the battlefield. And uh, in the process of digging stuff out, get all kinds of military stuff. It's very dangerous to do because if you dig up a rusty hand grenade, the thing can go off in your face. But uh, in this case, uh, the person who was doing this kept on digging. And down at the bottom of the hole, uh, he saw something that looked strange. And maybe you can identify that. That's the plug board of an enigma. So he cleared away some of the dirt. And now we see the light bulb uh, panel and the keyboard of the enigma and the metal locator in the back there. And we clean off more of the dirt and we find uh, that the enigma looks like this. So finding an, an Enigma machine like this uh, is very exciting and uh, rather fun as a treasure hunt. Um, we had heard that there was a, a lot of activity at the end of the war where Germans were throwing stuff into this lake in northern Germany. So we got out our scuba gear and we started uh, to go diving in the lake. And as you can see, the visibility in the lake is about one inch. So you have your face mask on, you can only see things that are about an inch in front of your eyes, and then it's just total silt and mud. Um, what do you do? You use an underwater metal locator, and you just move it back and forth until you get a metal contact. And we did that, and uh, this is what we found. In the foreground on the left, you see some experimental 
crop speed sensing torpedo parts. They uh, designed their torpedoes to explode when the propeller speed of certain ships was a, a, in a given range. On the right, uh, some German radios that had been thrown in there. But when the guy who was operating the metal detector reached up to see what he had found, uh, when he got this piece of metal out here, which was an Enigma machine, he got so excited that he dropped the metal detector and headed up for the surface. And we were never able to find the metal detector after that. It was just too murky a lake. We tried for a good long time. But anyway, we got an Enigma machine out of the lake. And here it is in all its beauty. This is uh, the way 99% of the enigmas that have survived actually look at this point. Um, the uh, front of the panel is kicked in by somebody, um, the um, uh, 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 rotor panel in the back there. But the most interesting thing is that the light bulb panel has been depressed here. And I looked at that and I said, you know, that that bend looks a little bit familiar. It's not an even bend that you would see if it had been hit by somebody's boot if they just kicked this thing. It looks a little bit like it might have been the butt of a rifle. So I found a friend with a German rifle and I got him to loan it to me and the rifle butt exactly fit into the depression in the light bulb panel. So we now know that it was the butt of a Mauser rifle uh, applied to the enigma that destroyed that particular enigma. Hunting for these enigmas is very interesting. What about the ones in submarines? Here's U-352, which looked like this before it was sunk. It was sunk off the Virginia, uh, South Carolina coast, and it's now a major dive destination for recreational divers. And one of them actually, a well-known uh, diver named uh, Richie Kohler entered the submarine. Uh, very scary thing to do. Um, very narrow places to go through with your multiple tanks. And he went in and he finally was able to dig the Enigma machine out of the radio room of the submarine. So this is an Enigma machine after it's been underwater for 70 years, under salt water for 70 years. Doesn't look much like an Enigma machine, but uh, it's a very interesting uh, device. Some Enigma machines actually survived. Here's a really nutty guy in Germany who had bought uh, most of an ME-109 fighter plane, uh, and he's restoring it in his garage. And what he really wanted for that uh, plane was an engine. And he said, I can buy an engine, but I don't have the money for it. And he got in touch with me because he knew that I was collecting Enigma machines. And he pointed to this Enigma machine. He said, would you be interested in trading me this Enigma machine for the engine for my ME-109 fighter plane? And I said, you bet I would, because that finger, his finger is pointing at a four rotor Enigma, not a three rotor Enigma uh, from a submarine. And they are selling these days for about $500,000. So <laughs> the uh, engine for the fighter plane cost a lot less than that. And uh, everybody came away happy. Um, here's another guy who had an Enigma machine for scale sale. Uh, he was very scary. He wanted to talk about his submachine gun more than he wanted to talk about the Enigma that he wanted to sell me. And he was telling me all these stories about his submachine, submarine, submachine gun and waving that thing around. <laughs> a very, very nervous time. So hunting for enigmas these days can be really quite extraordinarily uh, interesting and maybe dangerous. I've been doing it for 40 years and uh, met a lot of very odd people in the process. But this is the most exciting moment of all my 40 years of hunting when I met this guy and he said, yeah, I have a couple of enigmas in my living room and in the little cabinet. And he reached down and he pulled out three Enigma machines, his hand, the one he's pulling out now is the one that you see in the imitation game movie. And uh, he said, I, I think I want to sell these things. And I bought them from him. And that was very exciting. You don't find three Enigmas in one house very often. But it was very exciting. When I got it home, I uh, restored it back to original condition. You can see uh, down at the bottom and on the right that it was already in very, very good condition. So I just cleaned it up and uh, rewired it 
a few of the wires where the cold solder joints were causing a problem. And it was then um, sold to Bletchley Park in 2010 and showed up in the movie. So it was kind of fun to see the enigma that I had found in that movie. Just to end up, I'd like to uh, show you a couple of things about the American and other cipher machines. The Americans had a very neat little machine that you uh, can actually use right on your knee, totally non-electric. You would put the, uh, the uh, uh, letters that you wanted to encode in that little wheel that you see in the front, and then you would turn a crank, that black handle that you see in the back there, and uh, it would imprint a letter on this piece of paper tape, which would become the ciphertext version of whatever letter you had set into the code wheel. So you could encode a message in that way. And uh, decoding was a matter of flipping the switch that you see below the wheel from C, which means code, over to D, which is decode and setting the wheel at the ciphertext letters and the tape then prints out the plain text. This is a more complex version of a machine called the Sigaba that the American military used later in World War II. And as far as we can tell, it was never cracked by the, um, by the Germans during World War II. It was used also after World War II. One of the most interesting machines that I've come across is this Russian Fialka machine. And it is a 10 rotor Enigma-like machine. You can see the keyboard on the front, the rotors, 10 rotors here. Um, and it is capable of printing on a moving paper tape and punching the paper tape uh, at the same time. Uh, so you type in plain text on the keyboard, the rotors encode it, and it then will type out the cipher text on the paper tape or punch it so you can read it into a tape reader. On the left side, you see a little pull-out tray, which is the uh, equivalent of the Enigma uh, plug board. But the neat thing about the Russian Fialka is that every one of these 10 rotors rotates in a different direction uh, with relative to the rotor next to it. With an Enigma, all the rotors are always going in the same direction. And after the right hand most rotor has gone through 26 steps uh, for the 26 letters in the alphabet, it then kicks the next rotor to the left once. And it's like the odometer of a car. With this thing, these rotors counter rotate. They're all going in different directions. So very, very difficult uh, machine to crack. And finally, the uh, device that is being used at this point uh, is really simply a handy talkie with the equivalent of an enigma in it. It is a, an enciphered radio. Uh, that is capable of enciphering its messages. And you'll see these in use in the field and by the, the Secret Service. Now that's sort of a tour de force of uh, Enigma machines, the history, and uh, what's been going on. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'll stop this and uh, see if anybody has any questions at this point. Somebody must have a few questions. <laughs> You would think so. Okay, Bo, get your hands up there. Okay, this is this is John in Oceanside. Um, if you're copying me, I wanted to thank you. What a great, great presentation! Uh, all I can say is wow. Um, I did not know about the Polish uh, uh, precedent of the Enigma uh, decoding before the war, and uh, I wanted to let the other members know uh, that the um, uh, the Maritime Historical Society had an Enigma, um, uh, I guess not a contest, but a, uh, an operation in July of this past year where they sent a coded message, one from uh, one of Dernitz's submarines to Dernitz. And um, it was very interesting. I had never participated in uh, Enigma decoding using a virtualized Enigma. And one thing that was very impressive was if you did not copy the CW 100% accurately, if you dropped a letter, the rest of the message would not decode properly. So those CW operators had to be 100% accurate under wartime conditions, which was to me very extraordinary. 
and I did finally decode the message. So I want to thank you for uh, enlightening us. It's a, a tremendous uh, history in communications and ciphers. So uh, I really appreciate your presentation and thank you. Thanks for your comments. And uh, there are a couple of contests that are really fun to enter. You don't have to have an Enigma machine to enter them. You can now have an Enigma, Enigma simulator on any computer, and you can also have it on a smartphone. There are apps for a smartphone that do a superb job of emulating uh, an Enigma machine, all different types of Enigmas, the submarine four rotor and the Army Air Force three rotor and commercial and so on and uh, you can join in on these contests. The thing you need to know, though, is that it is highly illegal to transmit Enigma messages on the handbands without a very, very special permission. And uh, in some cases, these outfits have been able to um, get permission and to uh, uh, transmit messages, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, I've found that uh, you can also use SDR receivers if you're you're not in a position where the um, where the skip is appropriate for you. Be able to receive the transmission from the station that is sending the Enigma message. Uh, you can always find an SDR receiver. I hope you all know how to do that. You just go on an SDR site. And you can then use a receiver. You pick a site anywhere in the world uh, with most of them have amazing antennas hooked up to their receivers. Use their receiver and tune in on any frequency you want. So it's a neat way of hearing things that would be impossible to hear uh, because of the skip being inappropriate or the band is closed at your location. Um, so it, it's fun to do that. Other comments, please. Okay, yeah, we got two hands up. Scott, go ahead. Um, no question. Just Tom, outstanding presentation. Um, wow. Um, I'm really impressed. I'm going to do some research uh, on some stuff. I did not under realize a lot of this stuff. And um, my hat's off to you for your dedicated to, to understanding and preserving this bit of history. Uh, it, it's not often we get to see stuff like that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You can always come to my website, which is simply enigmamuseum.com. One word, enigmamuseum.com. You can email me, tom, at enigmamuseum.com. And of course, there are lots and lots of other good sites. If you want to get into this a little bit more, you want to read a book that's really nice, David Kahn, K-A-H-N, Maybe someone could type this into the chat uh, for us. Uh, David Kahn's book, Seizing the Enigma, is a great introduction. All the stuff that I've said and more uh, in, in very readable form. So that's I would recommend that. If you want something even more readable, <laughs> you can read a novel about it, uh, Harris's book, Enigma. Uh, and it's sort of a dramatic a uh, slightly hooked up version of what went on at Bletchley Park and a, a, a fun read. Well, thank you very much again. And um, uh, I'm really impressed. Good. All right. Thank you, Tom. Gene, go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, fantastic history lesson. Technical history lesson. Absolutely fantastic. And it's really piqued my curiosity. Uh, the question that I have is, I'm sure if these things have some type of security classification on them by uh, either the British government or the U.S. government, how long after the war did these things be, uh, stay as classified devices uh, before, you know, they were like shown to the public or presented to the public? Tom? Oh, you're muted, Tom. Tom, you're muted. Sorry about that. Good question, Gene. Uh, it's an interesting point. Uh, it sort of depends on the country and the machine that what we're talking about. For instance, the Sigaba that I showed is still considered secret by the government. They don't want people to, to know how those rotors were wired. The KL-7 that was used all through Vietnam and uh, many of you, if you had any contact with cryptography, use those machines. Uh, they're considered uh, still secret. The Russian 
percussion machine is rather interesting and very interesting, I think. The Fialka that I showed you, I was at a, the big ham fest in Germany called Friedrichshafen Ham Radio, followed by the year. And uh, a guy came up to me at the show and he sort of tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I see you're, you're interested in, an, in Enigma machines. Would you be interested in a Russian Enigma? And big Professor Tom, thinking I knew everything about enigmas, I said, oh, uh, pardon me, but there's no such thing as a Russian enigma. <laughs> and he said, well, sir, uh, what, would you follow me out to my car? <laughs> and I went out to his car and man, <laughs> that taught me a lesson. There was this Fialka sitting in the trunk of his car and he wanted desperately to have some American dollars and I wanted desperately to have his machine. So we made a deal. And I took his fialca and he said, well, sir, would you, uh, I have a few other things here. Would you be interested in an underwater machine gun? <laughs> and, and I said, there's, there's no such thing as an underwater machine gun. You shoot a gun in the water and the bullet goes, <laughs> it makes it about a foot and then drops. And he said, well, excuse me, sir, but this is a rather unique machine gun. And he proceeded to show me this thing with incredibly dense uh, deactivated uranium darts instead of bullets that had so much mass that apparently they go on through the water and it was real underwater machine gun. <laughs> and I said, how am I going to get that home through customs? <laughs> I said, thank you very much, but I don't think I had better buy that machine. But I did bring the Fialca home and that was the first one uh, that ever came to the country. And um, when I got here, I heard that the guy who sold it to me had been thrown in jail. And I started thinking, uh oh, and this at, this was at the time when they were still using the Fialka in the in the Russian military, fully using it. And so I said to myself, uh oh, this guy's going to tell who he sold this thing to. And the Russians. How did you get that through customs here in the States? <laughs> The mm -hmm. Russians are going to come and get me. And I, uh, at that point, I, I took it to a friend in the NSA, at the NSA museum, and I said, would you be interested in a, a Russian Fialka machine? And they really wanted it. So they traded me something that I wanted for that machine. It got out of, out of my hands, and I felt a lot better about that. But then after the Soviet Union disbanded, very interesting things have started happening. Uh, Fialka started turning up uh, in strange places. And uh, I noticed that they all had singe marks on them, like they'd been in a fire. And I finally found the story. There was one guy in a military base who would um, go out. And when they were destroying a bunch of um, broken Fialkas, uh, he would. He was the one who was supposed to destroy them, and he would have people come along with sledgehammers and bang on them, and then he would pour gasoline over the whole pile and set it on fire, and it would look like all the fialcas were completely scorched and gone, but he knew that the fialca on the absolute bottom uh, was completely cool because fire burns up and not down. And uh, uh, he would, at the, after this was all over, he'd grab one of those or two of those and bring them to Friedrichshafen, to the show in Friedrichshafen, uh, where we would all uh, buy them. And so when you look at most of the Fialkas that have survived, you'll see little singe marks on them. I don't think he was thrown in prison. I don't know. Anyway, it's an interesting experience interacting with people who are clearly uh, criminals. <laughs> you, you, something you don't really want to do very much at a ham fest. <laughs> okay, Paul, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. It was, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, last year, there was a, uh, a present, uh, an Enigma presentation at, at Pacificon uh, out here in uh, California. And the the presenter, I've forgotten his name. He has a Ralph, a, Ralph Simpson, wonderful guy, Ralph Simpson. Yes, yeah, that, yep. he did. He had a, a wonderful presentation, just like yours. And he actually had a machine there with them that we we were able to operate after the presentation was over. And it so yeah, uh, you know him. That that's good. Yeah, uh, both you guys are great. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, he, he's terrific. And uh, if you're ever on the East Coast, I do my in-person demonstrations mostly at the MIT Ham Fest uh, every month uh, from April through October, I guess they are, uh, in a parking garage at MIT. So <laughs> you come into this parking garage that's full, full of flea market stuff, and there's Enigma Tom set up with his <laughs> display showing off Enigma machines and having people come over and play with them. And the amazing thing is that a professor at the MIT actually bought one from me one year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ray, you got your hand up. We're going to take you, and then we'll go over here to the text. There's quite a bit of stuff in chat. Go ahead there, Ray. Hello, Ray. Put your hand away. Yeah, I'm muted. But, uh, Tom, I uh, wanted to say thank you for this presentation. It, uh, it really um, uh, complements uh, what I usually see out my way. Uh, because uh, it does that uh, nice little ham fest out in Deerfield, New Hampshire. And I see that thing there uh, up close and personal. So uh, this rolls right into what I've seen. And I was fascinated when I was watching it. Uh, a couple of times I wanted to talk to you and you usually have a crowd around you. So I never got the opportunity, but I'm, I'm glad I sat in on this story. And again, thank you very much. Uh, this is a you know a great piece of history that you got going. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Um, that's another ham fest that I do as regularly as I can. Uh, Deerfield, New Hampshire, now it's called the uh, Near Fest, once called Horse, Horse Traders, and uh, do uh, demonstrate machines there, sometimes give talks on them. And haven't ever sold an Enigma there, but I did sell about five Enigmas at Dayton over the years. And uh, some of the people that buy them at Dayton are, are very strange. And one guy is a, a lawyer in, um, in, in Chicago, and he had just won a lawsuit against uh, Microsoft. So he had a lot of money he had to get rid of. And he decided, I'm going to do something that no lawyer has ever done before. <laughs> I'm going to have an Enigma machine in my law office. And when a client comes in, I'm going to have the client type his name into the Enigma machine. And from that moment on, I'm only going to refer to him by his Enigma coded name, never by his real name <laughs> so the client comes in types on an enigma and that uh, produces a coded name and then he said you know next year he came back and said, you know i need to have one for my secretary so he bought another one then he said tom you know i think i need one at home <laughs> he ended up buying three enigmas from me <laughs> <laughs> oh you found a niche there um robert kd7 wnv and uh, Washington, you got. You look like you put out a uh, a PDF link there. Can you come on and tell us what that link is about? Well, that that was the uh, um, the book that he mentioned uh, that you could send off to the NSA for uh, about how uh, cryptology affected uh, early computing in uh, America. So it was just a, a link to that. You don't need to send off. You can download the PDF. Oh, great. Thank you. And they, they have a lot of fascinating PDFs. If you're really into cryptology, they have just put out one on the entire cryptological spectrum of World War I, really uh, thorough coverage of World War I stuff. Um, and they will send you hard copy or they'll send you a PDF, either one that you want. Thank you, Robert. That's a point I should have made. Um, there's a lot of sources of uh, information, but you can pretty much find anything you want to know on Google these days. It's a, a really good search engine. I guess they are using AI to real advantage, aren't they? <laughs> uh, and time marches on. Can you comment on how successful the Germans and the Japanese were in cracking our code messages? Um, well, all I can speak to is uh, the fact that... Um, uh, a couple of things, just to give you an idea of how hard it is to crack an Enigma machine without any of the techniques that the Poles used. Uh, brute force cracking, which is trying every one of the 10 to the 114th power combinations to try and get a solution, takes 100 uh, personal computers running in parallel for a year. So that's the typical 
crack an enigma time uh, for cracking the niche. Phil, a very, very secure um, encoding technique. Um, the uh, Give me your question again. I got carried away. Sorry, Dan. Well, they were just, I think the question was about if the Germans and Japanese were ever able to crack our code. Um, well, let's uh, let me tell you a little story about that. There's something called TICOM, T I C O M, Target Intelligence uh, Command. Uh, and what they did was in the last day of the war, they were poised in England. And they, at the, when the war was over, they entered uh, Germany, entered uh, Europe uh, in a convoy. And in three convoys, actually, and they went to the rocket center, German rocket center, the German uh, atomic bomb center and the Enigma or enciphering center. And they literally kidnapped the people who were there and brought them back to England uh, illegally at the end of the war. And then they debriefed them all. And so they learned uh, what had been in, uh, successfully decoded. And they found that the Germans were, were successful in decoding the simple American machine that I showed you. Um, the NSA will neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that they can crack the Russian Fialka. And I don't know much about uh, any of the other machines at this point. Um, certainly, the purple machine was cracked, the Japanese purple machine, but uh, unfortunately, nobody has ever found a purple machine to really be able to study it in detail. So even though they were able to crack the code, um, we've never seen the complete machine. Interesting, interesting. Um, Another question. Hold on, Dan. A good question just came in. Did the Germans share the enigma with Japan? Interesting story on that. The Germans indeed sent a submarine to Japan with a large number of Enigma machines on board. <laughs> and the uh, Allies deciphered the message and sank the submarine. So the Enigmas never got to Japan, but the Germans were uh, giving these Enigma machines to the Japanese to use. And uh, they still did manage to get some to Japan. The Japanese didn't like the Enigma machine very much. Um, so they decided they were going to build their own machine. And instead of using rotors, which is what the Enigma machine uses, the Japanese used stepping switches, like the old telephone stepping switches, um, almost as a direct replacement for rotors. Um, uh, and uh, so cracking the those codes was done, but uh, uh, the actual machines have not been seen. Okay. Uh, can you comment on the work of a fellow ham? He's now signed a key, a jo a Joseph D-E-S-C-H, what he did at NCR? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Joe Desch uh, was a extraordinary brain. And when the British developed Colossus to crack the, um, the uh, Enigma coded messages from submarines, the Americans wanted to build a similar machine. And uh, they set aside a secret part of a building in Dayton, Ohio, uh, part of the National Cash Register Company, but nobody knew it. They, it looked like it was just an empty classroom from the building plans. And in that classroom, Joe Desch uh, designed the machine that I showed you, sort of uh, the, the American version of the British bomb. Uh, and the National Cash Re Register uh, Company um, began manufacturing these, and they made uh, a great many of them, shipped them to Washington, and they were set up in a, a school in Washington where um, female operators uh, were taught how to use these machines to decipher the Enigma-coded um, submarine messages. So Joe Desch was an extraordinary brain. He was uh, persecuted. Very interesting book, if you want to read about it. It's called The Secret in Building 26. And uh, it was written uh, by partly by his daughter, Debbie Desch, and it explains that the military never trusted him. Even though he's building these bombs, they didn't trust him because he had a German name and he knew some German people. And so they had a, a military 
uh, represented live in his house with he and his wife to make sure he didn't do something bad uh, while he was building these machines. Uh, but um, we owe him a great debt of thanks for the incredible machines that he built. And his daughter has put up a website about Joe Desch, and he's one of the big important names in cryptology. Okay, David, N-A-S-B-E, can you come on and tell us about your experience that you wrote here in the chat? Oh, yeah, okay. I, I was just saying, you were talking about sometimes, uh, uh, you know, dealing with shady characters at swaps can be a little uh, strange. A few years back, I was at a swap in the Detroit area, and uh, the federal agents came in in a raid. <laughs> And they ended up essentially taking one of the sellers away in handcuffs. He had been selling apparently cracked satellite receivers. <laughs> so, yeah, so you do have to be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember seeing some of those at the uh, the um, uh, Orlando Ham Fest a couple of years ago. There are always somebody out there doing something uh, uh, shady, right? Cabins are just people. You're going to find all kinds of them. You've got to be careful the people, you, the friends you keep. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll mute Dave here and we'll look around. Anybody else got their hand up? No? Any other questions? You had a chance to go through There's lots of uh, attaboy type stuff and, and thank yous and stuff like that in chat. Just build a very good presentation. Okay, and, and feel free to email me, Tom, at enigmamuseum.com. I'll try and answer any questions, uh, fill in any gaps. And uh, thanks very much for your uh, patience and sitting through that long talk. Oh, it was, a, it was, <laughs> it was not, a, 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 yeah, it was great. Okay, Dave, uh, go ahead and take the floor. I guess that's me. Um, yep. I I was uh, just going to comment. Um, there's not a lot of the museums where you can actually play with an Enigma machine. Bletchley Park used to be one of them, and it may still be. I missed my opportunity to go this year because I got sick. But I recently spent some time at the NSA Museum, and they've got a couple of them set up there that you can play with. And it's an interesting experience to type on an Enigma. You, nobody touch types on these things. Maybe a Sagaba machine, you can do that because it's electric. But this thing, you really got to push that thing to get that thing to encode. So if you ever get a chance to play with one of these things, it's kind of an interesting experience. Yeah, thank you for your comment on that. Let me just uh, show you what uh, he's talking about here. This is... Uh... Uh, maybe you can spotlight me or or the machine. I'll just demonstrate. Uh, I'll probably turn out a light, but I'll push one of the keys down. You can see. We see it pretty good. We see it pretty good. Well, uh, let's see if we can see. Can it we? Was see? better before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, much better. Put the lights. Yeah, but I I want I want you to be able to see the lights lighting up. So <laughs> I'll I'll put that back on. This is pressing down a letter, and can you see the light bulb lighting up back there? Yes. I'm pushing down the same letter, and different light bulbs are lighting up, as I said, as the rotors rotate. Don't Push the same letter up. twice. Say again? I said push the same letter twice. Yeah, I've been doing that. And every oh, okay. I push it. Oh, there you go. Different light bulb. Yeah. That was another of its faults. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the actual pressure on the key, um, it takes a lot of force. You have to go from here quite far down in order to light up a light bulb. If you can see that light bulb lighting up over there, not very well, but um, so it's definitely not touch typing. And you can see that if you had a little loose plug down in the bottom there, this wouldn't go down all the way and the light bulb wouldn't light up. It's only the last part of the key press that lights up the light bulb. I learned how to type on a Model 60 teletype back <laughs> in the 60s, and they had keys like that too. You didn't tap them, you pushed them. Yeah, those teletypes were a lot of fun. Radio teletype with a machine was, was a, a real fun experience. 
Okay, uh, this has gone over the hour, obviously, but there was no way you guys were going to let me cut this short <laughs> and no way I wanted to. Are there any more questions out there? Hello, hello. Okay, speak up now. Uh, Hold your peace. <laughs> Chad, there's a question. Oh, okay, thank you. Go ahead. What's what? Do you see it there, Tom? Yep, go ahead. Oh, I'm, oh, what voltage was the battery? Oh, 4.5 volts. I like to run it on uh, on three volts because the light bulbs have to be flattened in order not to damage the light bulb panel. I can show you that. And uh, the light bulbs are very expensive. Some uh, original Enigma light bulbs can go for as much as 100 bucks. So you don't want to burn out your light bulbs. Um, I'll show you what they look like if I can get back on that uh, camera. Um, these little light bulbs are flattened uh, so as not to damage the light bulb panel, which has the letters on it up there. And uh, if you use round light bulbs, you, you damage the machine and destroy that letter panel. So you have to have to be careful. That's why I like to run them on three volts, even though the battery was originally a four and a half volt battery. And the battery, by the way, goes into this box back here. A little battery box um, in the back of the machine. How long did a battery usually last? Uh, I would say forever, practically, because you're know, you're only drawing, uh, you're only lighting up the light bulb for maybe a second or two while you write down the letter, and I would say you're not going to probably have Enigma messages more than uh, a couple of hundred characters, maybe. Um, worst case, maybe 500 or 1,000 characters a day. So it's just turning on and off a little bulb for that. And I, would, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody ever measured that. But interestingly enough, they, they were worried about it enough. So they have external terminals, um, which allow you to apply an external voltage to the machine. These two terminals that you see over here uh, are for... Uh, uh, external four, four and a half volts. Huh. <laughs> Don't connect to 12 or 14 volts. <laughs> Fry City. Okay, go, go ahead and take it. Thanks again, uh, Dan, and also Tom. Uh, my question is, how did you get started in the whole Enigma uh, hobby or vocation? Were you involved in uh, military cryptography yourself? Uh, what's your uh, backgrounds in this whole uh, process? Thanks, John. I'm just a ham and a professor of neuroscience. So I had a little bit of interest in coding and decoding the brain, for instance. Uh, when you look at something, it takes the thing you're looking at, inverts it, changes it into nerve impulses, feed it to, feeds it into your brain, and somehow those nerve impulses get decoded into whatever it is you're looking at. So that was one connection, but that wasn't the real one. The real one was I was at a ham fest in Germany, and the guy next to me had an Enigma machine, and uh, he wanted so much money for it. I think he wanted 4,000 bucks for it. It was, oh, just ridiculous. But I figured, what the heck? I'm probably not ever going to see another one of these. I'll take it home. And when I got it home, started doing some research on it, reading Davis Kahn's book and so on, I decided that it was uh, really fascinating and that uh, any machine that, <laughs> that could uh, do what the Enigma did, cracking the Enigma did during the war had to be um, a major collectible. And so I started learning about them, fixing them, writing books about them, giving talks on them. Somebody commented earlier with a question I didn't follow up on. Um, did you have any problems going through customs with those things? What is, uh, it's just a typewriter. They, just an old German typewriter, isn't it, huh? <laughs> it's got German uh, writing on it. It's just a typewriter. What the heck? <laughs> I think we have another shady person amongst us here. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, if you look carefully at the, uh, the uh, harmonized customs code, you find that anything that is of extraordinary historic value um, passes through with no duty. Uh, 
and nobody would question the fact that the enigma has extraordinary historic value. So that is not a dutiable item. Okay, very, very interesting, very interesting. Okay, I'm gonna throw it out there one more time, make sure I got everybody. Uh, anybody got any questions in chat or hands up? It's been, a, okay, Dave, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have one. Yeah, just one quick question. So there's a thing called the railroad enigma. Uh, can you comment on that? Is it any different than the, is it four rotor, three rotor in a different case or whatever? I was just curious. Yeah, sure, Dave. It, 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 they, um, the Enigma went through a number of different models. The design was always the same. The only thing that was really different was the wiring of the rotors, the so-called rotor maze, the wiring maze of the rotors. And the Railroad Enigma was a very early version. The Poles actually got their hands on one of those because, believe it or not, they, the Germans were selling them on the open market. They were even trying to sell Enigma machines in America. I have an American sales broker sure for the thing. And so that was called the commercial version. And when the military decided to take over production, they changed the rotor wiring. And that was uh, just so different that uh, it made the two machines very different. Uh, to answer your question, it is simply a three rotor machine. The only four rotor machines that were ever made and used by the Germans were for the submarine command. Uh, everything else has been three rotor, the Air Force, the Army, the police, um, and so on. Does that uh, answer you okay? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I have one more question. Sorry to keep you going. Um, the Sigaba machine, or Sigaba, I, I, I never knew how to pronounce that, I guess. My, my father actually used to use one of those things. He worked at uh, worked for the Atomic Energy Commission years ago and and they still had some of it when when it was still connected with the army you know and he he recognized the picture he says I know those things but it, is it still uh classified because I see them around mostly in museums but um you still see them every once in a while but you're saying they're it's still classified yeah, the uh, the thing that's classified is the wiring of the rotors, as far as I can tell. I just learned that the um, the historic ship museum, I guess it's maybe a, a destroyer or something, in Troy, New York, was given a Sigaba machine by the NSA um, for display there. But when I looked at that machine, it has no rotors in it. So the basic oh, wow. machine... Basic machines are out there, but I think that they consider that the the wiring maze, as I've called it through the talks, um, is still secret, and they don't want that information out there. Yeah, there. There's a good book on that you can also get from the NSA that talks uh, goes into a lot of detail about how that one is uh, how that one works for anybody who's interested. You can find it on the internet as well. Just Google Sigaba S I G A B A. Yeah, or just go on the NCM, National Cryptologic Museum website or NSA website and go to the uh, Cryptologic History section. And there are about half a dozen books that you can have free, mostly in PDF as well. Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Tom. Again, it's been a very good presentation. I am going to have to wrap this up. We've been at this over about an hour and a half now.